this song reminds us that we can also hear the word of God and not get it and not understand what the Lord wants us to learn from his word. And so I hope as we continue our study in the book of Jonah, as we continue to pour through this passage of scripture, uh, that we'll begin to start understanding what the Lord requires of us, because that's how the Lord uh, uses his word. It is a guide for us. It's a path that he lays down for us. And it's an opportunity for us to learn how the Lord wants us to live and act, for us to be able to show compassion and mercy to one another, and sometimes we really don't get that. And today we're gonna see in chapter three how the Lord continues to emphasize that even in the life of Jonah and the people of Nineveh. He will explain to them why compassion is important. It's who God is. So as we study this, I wanna continue to urge you to be reading through the book of Jonah on a regular basis. I would love for you to be reading it at least once a week where you read from cover to cover the whole thing. It won't take you very long to do so. It's a short book. Uh, There's only 48 verses, but I would encourage you to do so. And if you haven't been here, we had a a little card that we made the first week that we gathered. Uh, There will be one on the back table as you leave that will sort of give you an outline of the book of Jonah that you can put in your Bible and use that. Now, if you don't have a Bible at home, we'd love for you to take one of them that are in your pews, they're underneath the seat. Uh, If you don't have one that's a gift to you, Uh, from us, and we would love for you to have that opportunity to continue to read the Word of God, because this is what gives us hope and understanding and a a guide for our path. So we've been learning that in chapter 1, we've seen that we have a wandering prophet, one who has allowed himself to have distance between him and God, and we have learned that we can do the same in our own Christian walk. Spiritual decline comes when there's great distance between us and God when we don't have that connection, when we uh, are not making that regular time with him, it's easy for us to have great distance between us and God. Then we begin to wonder, is everything that's going on in this world, what does it mean and what is God trying to do in our life? It becomes muddied for us, it becomes cloudy, we can't understand what the Lord is doing, so we don't want to be remaining in that place of spiritual decline or distance from God, we desire to be back in his presence, because we know that that's where the greatest satisfaction comes in our walk with the Lord, is when we know and understand that we're in his presence and that we're in the palm of his hand. Jonah was a picture of a wandering prophet, and then chapter two shows us that we have a chasing God, one who will come after us when we wander and when we have that distance. Jonah tried to get as far away as possible from God, and he realized that he could never outrun him. He could never go as far away from the Lord to where he could never be found. It's not possible for you to have that experience with God, that he is always with you, and he will always chase you when you are his child. So we desire to be in that spot, but we also know that we have many different kinds of misconceptions about God, and today we're going to see some of those things play out in reality. Some of us might have this view that God is sort of like our next door neighbor, one that we'd be able to sit down with and, uh, and chat and that sort of thing. We have him as a Gentile or genteel God, a, a one that we just, it's a pally-pally kind of situation. We'd put our arm around him and we'd have that kind of relationship. And maybe that's the view that you have of God. But when Moses had the opportunity to be before the Lord in Genesis or Exodus chapter three, Moses comes up on the top of a mountain and sees this burning bush. And his response was that he would take off his sandals and realize that he was standing on holy ground because he understood that God was in the burning bush. And he had this holy reverence for the Lord. And he began to understand that the Lord uh, is to be revered and the Lord is to be cherished and the Lord is in that way. But sometimes we've domesticated God to where he'd be no greater than our grandfather and that his wisdom is only that that we'd have of a a good person telling us how to live our life. If that's your view of God, I believe Jonah's gonna speak to your heart this morning. But also I believe that there's others that have this view of God that, and this is sort of the the, um, front end and the back end. This is the other extreme that we go to, uh, is where we have this view of God that he is this God so distant from us that he's always angry. 
and God will never be on your side. So you believe that God is always punishing you for some of the things. He's always ready to pounce on you. He's already always ready to do or lead you into something that you would dread to be a part of. And you begin to then keep distance from God because it's a lot safer to be far from him. You don't want to be in that kind of situation. So you decide that you will stay away from the Lord because you really don't understand him. And you always think he's mad and angry at you. So we need to have a proper understanding. And I think the book of Jonah helps us as we look at chapter 1 and we see that Jonah is running. And what do we find? We have a God that's chasing In chapter 2, we see Jonah crying out to the Lord in his distress, and what do we hear? We hear a God that's ready to hear our worries and our concerns, and we're able to bring those to him and lay them before him. Jonah wanders from God, but instead of God pouncing, God chases. And when Jonah has hatred in his heart for the Ninevites, God shows that he loves the enemy, and he desires for them to know the good news that's found in him. And God then is the one who loves the least and the lost. He's the one that does love the wandering person. He loves the prodigal. He loves those. And when we look at the scriptures and see the cast of characters that began to follow after him, prostitutes and scandals, all these different people that were the down and out, the least and the lost, and they were the ones that gravitated to this gospel presentation of God. They were the ones who came in droves because they were rejected in their society, but they knew that they had a God in heaven that would receive them. When Jonah would want to leave Nineveh to all of its ways, and he hoped that they would Uh, received the uh, justice of God. He hoped that they would be able to see the anger of God. That's what he thought they were going to receive. And instead, God shows up and gives them mercy and relents in what he's going to do. And he proclaims that he would send a messenger. He even sends Jonah to the people that were God's enemy to speak to them. And there we see the grace and mercy of the Lord right before us in this book. When Jonah wants the Ninevites to reap What they sow, God delights in showing mercy. Now some of us can have this idea that we want everybody to get what they deserve. But the gospel reminds us that none of us get what we deserve when it comes to God's grace. When he shows his grace upon us, it truly is mercy. It's not what we did deserve. It's God showing forth his love and compassion toward us. And in Micah chapter 7, another prophet will tell us the same thing. Listen to how he describes the character of God in this way. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and passes over the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Now, I hope Jonah will give you a new picture of God because I believe the picture is being painted for us to understand who this God is that we believe and follow. And so if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn to chapter 3 in Jonah. And let's hear the word of the God uh, spoken to us this morning, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. There was probably about 150,000 people living in Nineveh at that time. And it was a three days journey to just walk through the city because of its breadth. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, that wasn't the only words that he spoke, but this is the one that Jonah wanted us to hear. He was preaching a message that God was coming in judgment to them. And the people of Nineveh then responded with this. They believed God, and they called for a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached even the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne, and he even removed his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And that was a typical way of repentance, a typical way of responding to the Lord speaking to you. 
And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor, nor flock, taste anything. He called for a national fasting. And let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. And let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they had turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for this part of the story that paints a picture of you that we want to understand. That you are holy and you are worthy of all of our reverence. And indeed, if we were in your presence, we'd fall upon our face and realize that we're in the midst of holiness, just as Isaiah did as he had a glimpse of the temple and you're sitting on the throne. Just as John in the New Testament in the book of Revelation has the same kind of reaction and he sees when you give him a picture of heaven that all the people that were gathered around your throne were bending their knee and falling before you in worship and adoration. Oh Lord, that should be the response of our heart and the way that we live our life, that we would revere you, that we would see you as holy, and we would pursue holiness in our own way because we are followers of you. And we thank you that you are a God who shows mercy and compassion, that you delight to do it. And so in the hearing of your word this morning, may that give us hope to know whether we are followers of Christ or not. May it be hope to those that don't follow you, that they can be received and understand that compassion and mercy is theirs even today in the hearing of your word. And for us that have been following you when we might have been experiencing spiritual decline in our life, may you renew us and refresh us and bring revival to not only this church, but even to the city of Kansas. As we marvel that you have done this in the past, that you've turned whole cities upside down like you did in Nineveh. And they repented and turned from their sins and began to worship you with their lives. May you do that even in our day. May you begin in this church, in our lives. For we desire to be your people, to be your salt and light in this world for your glory's sake. So we pray that renewal and refreshment would come even as we hear your word preached this morning. For your glory's sake we pray. Amen. Let's begin for a moment thinking about the Ninevites. We haven't talked a lot about them, but you need to understand what kind of people they were and why Jonah would run in the first place. He detested the Ninevites because of who they were and the type of people they were. He sort of had this spiritual arrogance to think that he was better than them and that they weren't worthy of hearing the message that God had given to him to go and proclaim. Jonah was a prophet. And he was the one that was spoken of in the earlier parts of the Old Testament to remind us uh, that this is the role of the prophet. He's to be the spokesperson for God. And he didn't want to take that message because of his own spiritual misunderstanding, his misconception of who this kind of God was. He didn't like that if he would proclaim the message that the Ninevites would have a chance to be redeemed. And maybe sometimes we think the same way as Christians that we can have the spiritual arrogance ourselves and think that those that are not part of the church and those that don't live the life the way they do, you don't want them to receive the mercy of God. And there unfortunately are some like that. I've run into them in my ministry experience of people that just don't get it and they don't understand that compassion is who God is and how it's so easy for us to uh, instead run instead of proclaiming what God intended us to do. The Ninevites were idol worshipers. We get that glimpse back in chapter 2. I didn't say much about it last week, but listen to what the verse said in verse 8 in chapter 2. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. 
Now, Jonah was making this part of his prayer, and what he was saying was that he understood the Ninevites were those that were putting all their hope and strength in idols, things that they could make with their hands, and they could put up on their table stands and be able to worship it and hope that some rock or carving or some carved out piece of wood or maybe a necklace that was put around their neck that they would wear, that they would put their hope in these tokens and put their hope and maybe even pray to those sort of things. And Jonah understood that that's idol worship, and we've learned about that and how easy it is for us to make idols in our life, how easy it is for us to take our success and begin to worship it. We take our work and we might even begin to see, oh, look at what I've been able to accomplish in my lifetime, what I've been able to do, and we begin to worship the idol that is there. We have idol factories in our hearts, as John Calvin would say. We've allowed ourselves to look at these things, all of the power, the prestige, the money, the success, and even sex and every different kind of thing that we can imagine, and we use them as idols and try to find satisfaction in them. Well, that's what the people of Nineveh were doing. They were the most powerful nation at the time that Jonah was called to go and proclaim to them. They were a rising power, and eventually they would come and destroy the northern tribes of Israel and take them into captivity. Uh, And then never would they return to Israel again. That's how powerful they were, but they began to put their trust in their power and in their strength. They thought they could save themselves, and because they were so strong and there was no other power to conquer them, that even increased their pride and their arrogance. And we've seen how that happens throughout history, how we see nations rise in that sort of capacity, how we uh, can see them rise and fall because of the difference that they had. But they worshiped their strength and their might and their power, and so their pride made them be godless people. They didn't believe that they needed God. And maybe you're here the same way, thinking that you have uh, seen what you've been able to accomplish in your life, and you've put your trust in your money, and you've put your trust in what your career has done for you, and you've tried to live it alone. You've been trying to do the same thing that Jonah was doing. You didn't have to go and hop in a boat to try to get far from God. You're far from God just by the way you live your life. And Jonah speaks to us to give us a different picture of the kind of God we should receive, that we should always understand that if we find ourselves in that condition, we have a God that will welcome us back, a God that is compassionate, a God who will give us second chances, a God who is willing to welcome home all of those that have said, I don't want you, but then when you come back, he wants you to understand that he's always wanted you and he's never wanted to leave you. And he welcomes you with open arms. The Ninevites were satisfied in their own accomplishments, in their own power, their own ability, and they were a ruthless and evil people. And now you can probably understand why Jonah detested them. He wanted them to get what they deserved. And unfortunately, we sometimes have that same attitude to people we don't like. That we think, well, let's let them have or get what they deserve. And the last thing we want to do is to start telling them about God. And I hope we can understand that if that's the attitude of our heart, it's what the book of Jonah is trying to correct. It's the very thing that the Lord wants us to see, that we should never be acting that way, because if we begin to study who our God is and what type of God he is, he is a God of compassion and mercy. Really what the world needs and he will destroy all the idols and all the pursuit of satisfaction in those things, and he wants you to lay those things down and return to him and come back to him. He wanted them to get what they deserved, but God wanted to show Jonah that he is a merciful God and a God of compassion. So in Jonah chapter 1, back in that uh, chapter, in the early verse, he said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. 
And the Lord is reminding us that this is the type of God. He, he understands how evil we can be, and yet he's gracious in even sending Jonah. He's gracious in redeeming you out of the darkness and bringing you into the marvelous light. So then you go back into the darkness, and you shine as lights in the midst of darkness. And that's what Jesus starts to preach in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount and calls us a city that's on a hill. It's so something that can be seen and visible. So the church becomes that kind of agent as the Lord uses us to accomplish this end, to bring renewal to people that are living in darkness, to bring mercy to people who are doing evil, to show compassion. And if we really understand it, he did exactly that to you because you were God's enemy. And if God wanted to treat us the way we want to treat people, then we would never have mercy and compassion. And instead, while we were God's enemy, he would even send his son, Jesus Christ, to come and die for us, even when we were a great distance from God, and he would say, I want to bring you back, and here's the extent that I'm going to go. I will offer my son, and he will offer a perfect sacrifice to make you right with God. And we begin to see how Jesus is seen in this passage of Jonah over and over again. Because even at the end of the prayer in chapter two, Jonah said this, salvation belongs to the Lord. And really what he's saying is that he's trumpeting this idea that God is a God of salvation. And that's the message we take to a lost world, that God desires to reclaim you, to bring you back home and to restore you. And you know what, he's done that in my life. And then you have the opportunity to speak to your coworker, your neighbor, maybe someone in your family that doesn't know the Lord. You have the opportunity to proclaim what the Lord is. He's the God of salvation. And he desires for all of his children to come home and know him. And he has planted us as his church and his people to do that very work. God delights in rescuing the perishing. Jonah didn't have a heart like God in this story. And when we read the next chapter next week, we're going to even see again where Jonah just doesn't get it, and that's really how the book ends. It ends with a prophet of God that really doesn't get who he was proclaiming. And we're going to see his anger next week. He's angry at God because he would show mercy. And if that is your attitude, then the book of Jonah has been written for you to speak to you and to tear down your belief that that's the kind of God we would follow. Because God is slow to anger and God is compassionate and not willing that any would perish. And the extent that he would go to would be offering his son in order to make all things right and restore the paradise that was lost. And he desires to bring people out of the pit, just as he did in the life of Jonah, who was into the belly of a fish and headed toward death. And the Lord redeemed him and brought him out and spits him out on the dry land. And and that's the story for us to remember. This is what God does with his people and for the lost. And so what happens in Nineveh is a remarkable story. The whole city experiences the revival. A prophet who goes reluctantly even to preach the the good news, but he goes and he becomes the herald and God uses the preaching of Jonah, but it's the power of God that comes in the preaching that Jonah would have. And the power of God sweeps over the city. It's sort of like the fog coming in and resting on Nineveh. But instead it is the power of the Holy Spirit working in their life. And then from least to first. All they do is everyone returns and repents and relents of their sin. They turn away from what they're doing. And a massive amount of people came to God. It's similar to uh, Acts chapter 2 when Peter preaches in Jerusalem and 3,000 people come to the Lord in the hearing of his word. And a great revival came in Jerusalem. And God has been doing that throughout history. If you've read some of the revivals in church history, you hear what, how the Lord has uh, come into the people. But it's always the power of God falling upon the hearts of people and renewing them and restoring them and turning them towards home. They turn from their sin and we have a picture painted for us of what it looked like. Jonah preached and God brought his power. His power. 
And the people of Nineveh in verse 5, they believed in God. That was the response to hearing the preached word. So maybe that's something that you need to do today as you hear the preached word before you this morning, that you too would see that the Holy Spirit would come in your life and restore you and renew you and bring you back with saving grace. And the people responded, and even the king declares a national fasting for the people and let them call out mightily to God. And there's the steps you need to take to return to the Lord in this sense is that you believe in him and then you cry out to him and let everyone turn from their evil ways. There's a simple picture of what salvation looks like. That if you have this idea of you're trying to figure out who God is, that the Lord desires for you to turn from your sin, to cast away all the idols that you've made in your life and how you're trying to seek satisfaction in them. He's telling you to cast those aside and return to him because he will be the one who truly gives you the greatest satisfaction. And you'll see over a lifetime how futile it is for you to chase after the wind, to allow the pursuit of power and success to give you meaning because it could be gone tomorrow and you'll try to find something else to replace it. Well, the scriptures are going to tell you, replace it with God. That's how you were intended. You were created for that. We were all created with a God-shaped hole in our heart and he desires to be king. And the struggle is that we want to be our own king. And there's the battle. There's the tension. And Jonah is also wanting to be setting his own destiny. And he wants to not do what the Lord does. He doesn't want the people to receive mercy because he he feels that they should get what they deserve. He had the wrong heart attitude. And the Lord comes into our life and starts changing our hearts. Changing our hearts so that we have a whole new way at looking at the lost and the least. And that we become compassionate people because God is a God of compassion. For a church to not be outward reaching is a church that doesn't get what God is. When we are not doing the task that God has called us to be as a church, then we too are just like Jonah, that we don't get it. And we can sit and have a comfortable country club type of church, but if we are not reaching to the released and the lost and compelled because we have a God who is compassionate and he showed compassion to me so he wants me to do the same to those around me and he's placed me here at this particular point in time to do that when we don't get that. We don't see the power of the Lord working in our churches in that way. We don't see renewal and revival. So the Lord is doing a work even in our midst as we join together at Covenant Chapel and and Cornerstone together, the Lord is doing something unique, a wonderful story for us to all have second chances at doing the work that the Lord wanted us to do, to be a church that he desires for us to be, to be the spokespeople for God's good message that everybody needs to hear. Even the Ninevites that were the enemy of God, God showed compassion. And so when we look upon our city, And as Doug prayed in the pastoral prayer, and we hear about all the blight, all the difficulties that are going on in this city, do you believe that God could bring renewal and revival to this city? Do you believe he's powerful enough to make that happen in our midst and maybe even through us and other churches that get it as well? I hope it's something that you'd be praying for. I hope it's something that you desire to do. I hope it's what you practice in your daily living that when you go to work tomorrow, that you understand that you're there for an intentional purpose for the Lord to use you in whatever shape or form it may be. Tomorrow when you go back to school, as students, you see that the Lord has planted you for there for that very purpose and that he can use you in that particular way because the Lord is even gracious to his enemy and he may use you to be able to speak to the enemies of God and maybe even to your own enemies like Corey Ten Boom. I've, you've heard me speak about her many times and I want to end with a little story about her experience. Again, she had that opportunity. I've used an illustration about how she met one of the captors, one of the uh, soldiers that were used in there, but she had an opportunity about 10 weeks after she was liberated from the prison. You remember her sister Betsy was there and she died in the concentration camp. Well, 
Corrie ten Boone took her sister to the nurse, and the nurse was very brutal with her, was cruel. And when Corrie ten Boone was out speaking, she saw a lady that she realized was a nurse. And this nurse didn't want to look at her because she recognized Corrie ten Boom. And so as Corrie was sitting there seeing this lady in her midst, and she sees that she's putting her head down and doesn't want to make eye contact, Corrie's heart starts to breed this anger and rage. She is so angry that uh, she was like Jonah. She didn't want this nurse to see and hear the good news. And so what was Corrie's response? She began to pray and she said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me that I don't love my enemy enough to tell the good news to them. So Corey was able to find out who she was and get her phone number, and she phoned her, and she said, will you come to a meeting that I'm going to be speaking at next week? And the nurse was startled that she would even be gracious enough to invite her. She said, you really want me to come? And she said, yes, that's why I'm calling. And Corey then went and spoke at that meeting, and afterwards she sat down with the nurse and began to share the good news, the gospel, because after she'd been praying for a week and trying to subside the anger and rage that was in her heart because she thought that nurse should have deserved justice, justice of God, and she read from her 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. And as she sat there with that nurse, that nurse that day, surrendered her idols, surrendered her life to God, and here the captive restored the captor. And here the Lord will do that work in our midst. He's been doing it over and over again. And he desires to use us, his church, for that very end. Because he showed you how far he would go that he would give his own son to do the same. And Jesus came to die for his enemies. And Jesus came to die for you while you were an enemy of God. And God didn't want you to get what you deserved. Instead, he showed you mercy. And so we should be, of all people, the most compassionate. And unfortunately, the church worldwide often doesn't have that picture painted of them. But we should be a people of compassion and mercy, serving the Lord in whatever arena it may be, the gifts and talents that he's given to you, so that his glory would be seen in redeeming the perishing, rescuing the lost, because the Lord has a heart for the least and the lost. What about you? Let's pray.